I have the opportunity to go to work for one of the great iconic brands, NBC, NBC Sports. And yet, if we're not progressive and smart, we're gonna wake up in a couple of years and feel like we own the corner record store. Like, that's gonna keep me on my toes. That's the challenge I need. In my time at Notre Dame, I've leaned on insights from a host of great leaders. And one topic that typically comes up is culture. Enter Benchwarmers, a series of conversations about winning cultures, how they're developed, how they're sustained, and even what undoes them. Like many spirited conversations at Notre Dame, we share these ideas on a bench. This first season was filmed in 2019, before the pandemic would have made this production much different. Our next guest is Pete Bavacqua, chairman of NBC Sports. Pete served as the CEO of PGA of America before joining NBC. A former walk-on punter for Notre Dame football, Pete graduated magna cum laude with a BA in English in 1993. He then got his JD from Georgetown in 1997 before joining the firm of Davis, Polk, and Wardwell in New York City. Pete and his wife Tiffany have three children. Please welcome Pete Bavacqua. Pete, welcome. Jack, yeah, it's great to be here. I always uh, love being on campus, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful morning here in, at Notre Dame. The thing that's so dear and near to, I know, both of us is the partnership sure. between Notre Dame and NBC. No, Talk I, about its importance from your perspective. Well, I, it's, you know, I think about when I was a student here at Notre Dame is really when the NBC partnership started. So I, I enjoyed it as a student and thinking, oh my gosh, isn't this wonderful? Notre Dame has its own television network and NBC and NBC Sports. And I think it was really just a great step forward for, for both entities. And I think there's such a level of trust. And I think back, Jack, to a year ago when you came and visited us with your team and you said, hey, I really want NBC to push the envelope. Take some chances because we know you're not gonna let us down. We trust you, you trust us. And I think that's how I would define this partnership. It's really built on trust and those are the best types of relationships in business. Um, you mentioned having gone to school here, uh, you grew up on the East Coast. Dad was a dentist, correct? Dad was a dentist. I was the youngest of five, four older sisters and I was uh, truly brainwashed since birth about Notre Dame. I, uh, we would come out to campus. A few of my sisters went to Notre Dame. My father, when we were growing up watching Notre Dame games, he would get so nervous that he would take a little transistor radio and almost like Forrest Gump, just run. <laughs> and then at the end of the game, you know, there were no cell phones back then. He would go to a payphone, he'd call my mom and we'd go pick him up. And he would be miles away when I was a little kid. So I really grew up uh, the major goal in my life from what I can remember was to get into Notre Dame. Dad also gave you a love of golf. Gave me a love of golf. You know, I, when I was, a, uh, again, a, a little kid, I said, Dad, I want to I wanna learn how to play golf. And he had played a lot of golf and then being busy as a dentist and having five children had kind of given it up for a while. And he said, hey, the best way to learn this game is to caddy. Caddying. You learn so much about people. You see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think that's one of the great benefits of caddying is you become a great observer of people and how they interact with each other and how they, they face different types of circumstances. It's eye open. Yeah. You may be the only person I've met in my life that sort of professionally so married their passions to their careers. Yeah. I mean, you, you wind up leading the PGA. How did that come to be? Yeah, I, I think, again, I go back to my father always saying, again, being a dentist, you have to be a great communicator because you're, you're the king of one-sided conversations. So my father was one of the great, the great talkers in this world and was always talking and would always preach to us, you gotta enjoy what you're doing or it's gonna be a tough life. Went to Notre Dame obviously and then went to Georgetown for law school and was at, much like you, a big law firm uh, in New York, Davis Polk and Wardwell. 
And Jack, I knew almost within 30 days that, okay, this is going to be a great education for me and a great experience, but this isn't what I'm about. This isn't what I was meant to do. Davis Polk had this alumni directory for all the people who were at Davis Polk, where they ended up. Mm -hmm. And I said, let me see where these people go from here. And I started flipping through it. And luckily, I just had to get to the bees. And it was Romani Burson, and she was the general counsel for the United States Golf Association. And it was kind of this eureka moment, like, oh, wait a second. That's right. Like, these sports leagues need lawyers, too. You know, my father died way too young in a car accident. And it was a kind of a confluence of that happening and kind of saying, wait a second, like, life can be short and happiness can be fleeting and saying, I have to go do something. I have to follow my passion. I always love sports. And this was like, hey, I can take all of this training I've had and apply it to sports. And it was like flipping a switch. I showed up at the USGA and it was like getting shot out of a can and like, okay, this is what I was meant to do. I was meant to combine my passion in life for sports for, with what I've been trained to do. Out of the blue, I got a call that the PGA of America was looking for a new CEO and my name had been given by a few people. That's like a dream job. It's like being shortstop for the Yankees for me. Yeah, <laughs> or the quarterback for Notre Dame. And I just loved it, Jack. I, you know, I, I got there and what struck me out of the gate was a bunch of passionate people, but there was no strategic plan. Whether you're running the PGA of America, the, the athletic department of the University of Notre Dame or a bake sale, you need a plan. And so that the, the essence of the strategic plan we came up with was, was, hey, if we can be aligned, if we can combine the fact that we represent these 29,000 people that wake up every day and are truly the tangible connection between the game and everybody that plays it in this country, if we can come together, we should absolutely be the most influential golf entity in the U.S. and maybe the world. You know, you talk about leadership style and you talk about building a team you know, I, I always go back to some just kind of simple lessons, simple points, you know, one of which is, and I would always tell this to our team, you, you, you can't be afraid to get hit by the pitch. Let's make some mistakes, smart mistakes, learn from them and really try to be progressive. Let's not be fearful. I, I said, you know, at the PGA of America, I don't care if you've been here for 40 years or you just started last week, like we want to hear your viewpoint. And if you're in the finance department, that doesn't mean you can't have a great idea about what we're doing at the Ryder Cup. And that kind of real, kind of bringing people together, talking things through, and much like, you know, Brian Kelly does or any great head coach, like, let's hash it out. And then once we come out of that locker room, like, then we're all together. I said to the staff, when you, if you go back to your desk and there's an email or a voicemail from the head of Company X, or there's, a, or there's an email or a voicemail from a PGA member, you get back to the PGA member first. That's who we work for. And then as I would travel, when I would go into golf shops, what would always just get under my skin is usually it would be a young assistant professional and they'd say, oh, Mr. Bavacqua, and I would always stop them. And I would say, I'm not, I'm not Mr. Bavacqua, you, you, Pete, you know, I work for you. And changing that culture, because I think when I got to the PGA of America, the feeling from the membership generally was there was a, a lack of connectivity between the staff and the membership. And we did, and I tried to do everything we could to flip that. You mentioned something which has really been critical for me in my time here at Notre Dame. When I arrived, I thought we had terrible customer confusion. We, we, we had commercial partners. Yeah. We had the administration. We had the sports media. We had the fans who buy tickets. And, and a group it, of professors, right? Yeah, and it really impacted our decision making because there was just a lack of clarity about who our customer was. And much like you did with the members of the thing we tried to do very quickly in my time here was to say, we only have one customer. It's the student. Yeah. Yeah. All of the others are resources to help us do our job for the student. But when we make decisions here, 
we have to ask ourselves, how does it relate to our obligation to the student? And just that clarity, right? Just, just getting everybody in the business to say, oh, okay, this is who we work for. Yeah. This is what we're doing. Made decision making and allocation of resources so much easier. It's interesting you say that. We had a board member who had a brilliant idea. So I, re- at the, as the CEO of the PGA of America, I reported to a 21 person board. 19 of those people were PGA professionals and then we had two outside directors. And in one meeting, I remember one of the outside directors saying, you know, we should put a chair in this boardroom and leave it empty. And always think about that PGA professional out there in the country. And that's, that's him, that's her. So when we're making decisions about the Ryder Cup or what we should do with the PGA Championship or what we should do with uh, any type of issue, we can always come back and think, okay, who's that 35, 45, 55 year old person in, in Kansas, in Florida, in North Carolina? What can we do to benefit him or her? And it was, it was powerful. Well, then I think somewhat out of the blue, the call comes from Mark Lazarus. Yeah, did I, you get, see I get it, these did, phone did, calls. Did, did you see it coming? Not at all. Not at all. And it's interesting. So I absolutely loved the PGA of America. I would tell you my last year, I was finding it was getting a little repetitive. And it wasn't like I hemmed and hawed and did a column of positives and negatives. <laughs> I, Mark said the idea. He goes, I've been charged to bring in my successor. He goes, and I think it should be you. He goes, Do you, are you interested? And I thought about it for under 10 seconds. I said, Mark, oh my God, yeah, let's meet. I have the opportunity to go to work for one of the great iconic brands, NBC, NBC Sports. And yet, if we're not progressive and smart, we're going to wake up in a couple of years and feel like we own the corner record store. Like that's going to keep me on my toes. That's the challenge I need. You're coming to a business with one of the richest traditions and clearest identities. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of it built around the Olympics. Now Sunday night football. Yeah. Part of that's the property, but part of that is NBC has always brought this remarkable storytelling capability, and you're operating it in the most dynamic possible industry. Everything's changing. Everything's changing. How do you marry those two things? How does that work? Well, I think it goes back to that storytelling. I think it is what separates us. And everything is changing in the industry. But sports is so special because it's kind of, it, it continues to, to rise above the noise. And in a world where you're consumed with watching things and when you want to and, and how often you want to and in your own schedule, you're going to watch this game today at 2.30. Mm-hmm. And that's the power of sports. It's still what you need to watch and you need to watch it live. And what I love about NBC and what really allows us to separate ourselves is something called Symphony. And that was a creation of Steve Burke. And Steve said, you know, we have to take the entire NBC Universal portfolio and put it to work. So when we're heading into Tokyo for the Olympics, all of NBC Universal will be behind the Olympics. You'll hear about the Olympics, not just on NBC Sports or NBC Sports Network or on the Golf Channel, but on the Today Show, references in our dramas, skits in Saturday Night Live, uh, uh, rides in, our, in Universal Parks. And when you can put the entire weight and power of NBC Universal and then layer on top of it Comcast and the amount and the percentage of individuals we can touch mm-hmm. and put a, put a directed message behind that. I think that's really what separates us from others. And that is a very orchestrated approach that has proven to work over and over and over again. And it's exciting to see that in action. Yeah, I think in an an expanding and dynamic industry like we both operate in, in a sense, I I do think you guys have the clearest identity. I think the, the sort of knowledge about who you are and what you represent is more clearly drawn than, than anyone else. And I think that's a credit to you and others who helped shape that. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. Pete, I mentioned that you're in one of the most rapidly changing industries that there is, that exists in the world. It lives on innovation. Innovation is 
part of every day there. There's, there's a new idea, new technology, a new product. How, how do you manage that inside the culture you want to build? How do those two things come together? So it's always kind of not getting too comfortable with what we're doing, trying to stay one step ahead of it. And I always say, hey, let's put ourselves in the position of my 12-year-old daughter, my nine and six-year-old sons. How is that culture where they consume content continuously? 90% of it probably starts on YouTube and then branches out into Mm -hmm. a million different directions. How do we learn lessons from that? Still do what we do best, telling those stories, making big events bigger but understanding that we're gonna have to pivot and evolve if we're gonna attract that new generation. And it goes back to that, hey, let's let's take chances. Not everything is gonna be a home run out of the box. And you know, I think we always have to keep an eye out to how are people going to consume content in the future. And I think if particularly with sports, it's gonna be heavily data driven. And I would imagine you probably have these same challenges day in and day out. Yeah, no, we definitely do. There's sort of three elements to, to I think, how we try and approach it. One is to look behind whatever the development of the technology is. Uh, don't, get, don't get focused on that, but what's its significance? <clears throat> The significance of YouTube can be seen as sort of from a business perspective, um, from a reach perspective, but its greatest significance was it made everybody a producer yeah, of content, yeah. right? Sure. And so you could be now, six years old and be a producer of exactly. content. Exactly. And so they now they now <clears throat> carry forward with them an expectation to be involved in the production. What does that mean for us? The video gamer plays the game from a point of view perspective. Well, I think when he watches our games, he's got to have a, an occasional yeah. point of view perspective, right? Because yeah. that's what he or she is used to. So, so that dynamic of looking behind it, don't get blinded by the latest bling, right? I mean, yeah. part of the problem we have, especially in sports performance, <laughs> is every week someone's bringing something new to us. It's going to make our athletes faster, stronger. How do you separate that out? Well, the only way to separate that out is what you said before talking about the PGA. Have a real plan. Yeah. If, if I can't see how this intersects with what we said our priorities were, it may be the neatest technology in the world. We're not going there. But the other thing, again, very consistent with getting hit by the pitch, uh, the, you cannot be afraid to fail. When we made a very fundamental choice to completely reorient our media company inside Notre Dame Athletics to be an enabler of the student athlete voice, we stopped doing a whole lot of things in traditional sports media functions that universities have always done and said, we're going to go over here. We're going to be a different company. And I may find out two years from now, it was a colossal miss, but you you, you can't be in this environment and not take those big swings, right? It's not a, it's not marginal change anymore. It's, it's got to be intentional. It's got to be consistent with your values, but take the swing. We might be on a bench down on the field, uh, but production made it better for us to be on a bench up here uh, above the stadium. But why this bench? Well, for me, it goes back to my father and childhood and what this university has meant to me truly and literally for as long as I can remember. You know, Notre Dame, it was all about Notre Dame. It was the purity of Notre Dame and what Notre Dame stands for and how Notre Dame is kind of a constant. And it's always been a constant in my life. I mean, I grew up knowing this is where I was going to go to school. It was the only school I applied to. And people said, well, did it live up to your expectations? And it far exceeded them. And I, I, I had these conversations. I had a group of roommates, four roommates, so the five of us. And we're, we're always constantly amazed at the impact four years here can have on you. And if you divide your life into four-year segments, you have a lot of four-year segments, yeah. more and more as you get older and older. But the power of these four years is, is like, like you can't even describe it. And you, as busy as you are and whatever your problems might be and everybody has issues and problems and you're dealing with things, you're like, when you come onto this campus, it's just, it transforms you. And, you know, I don't want it to sound overly simplistic, but there's, there's a wholesomeness to this place. And nobody's perfect. No institution is perfect. But this is about as close to perfect as anything gets. 
And it's just, it's uplifting. There's an energy here. And I actually think the importance of Notre Dame, unlike just about any other academic institution or university, and I tell this to, to kids and, and people that call me and thinking about going to Notre Dame, the importance of it and your connection to it increases yes. as you get older. Mm -hmm. And that's rare. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I remember meeting somebody, uh, a person I admire, and we were having a conversation and I connected myself to Notre Dame. And he goes, he goes, one of the great things in life, he goes, anybody who goes to Notre Dame, you know about it usually within the first 90 seconds <laughs> you've met them. And people are proud of this yeah. university. And I, I just, I, I can't say enough about it. And I think about my three children and the hope that they can maybe share in this experience. But I, I just I just feel it's one of these truly special, great places in the world. And it's been, for me, it connects me to my father, my family, all those memories of coming here. And I just pinch myself every time I come back. And now, as, as you said, to be able to combine other than my family, the thing I love most, Notre Dame, with what I do for uh, a living is, is, is really, really special. Yeah, well, the, ultimately the strength of this place is its people, and you're a great example of that. You do such a great job of representing this institution. For whatever you may gain from it, we gain a ton by having you affiliated with us. We're so proud to be your partner in your, in your current position. Look forward to working with you for a lot of years. Thank Thanks, you, Pete. Jack. Thank you.